The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. The Investment Fix Podcast. Tune in today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai, hoki mai, ki a The Fold e mihi nei ko Duncan Grieve to ko Ingoa. Uh, this is a real good one. Um, just going to come straight in with that. My guest today is Joe Damon, who... I must confess, being someone who has basically very deliberately uh, taken almost all social media out of my life, was only peripherally aware of. I read a profile of him uh, written by Stuart Soman Lund, our uh, Live Updates editor, who was a year behind him in high school. And I was like, this guy, he sounds, sounds interesting. He's a, he's a comedian and a, uh, well, he's a whole lot more than that. But uh, that, that's basically the sense of him that I had. I saw him on Celebrity Treasure Island and he was very funny and very cerebral and he was part of this kind of group of comics and you know creative people that, that were part of what made that show have so much heart. Uh, he messaged me, Joe did, um, a few months ago uh, just you know saying that you know, he, he basically, I think, smashed out most of the, the fold. Um, and that kind of says something because, you know, to be honest, this is, this is for people in the media and the business of the media. And, you know, the fact that this person who has basically appeared to be talent side – was so engaged with it. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I mean, I'm flattered, obviously. But that's because he's using Talent Side to build his business. His business is West Park, which is a production company. They employ six or seven people. They've got five projects in development, one of which is going to Comedy Central in the UK. I mean, this is a massive story, which should be more widely known. I should know about it. Uh, I do now, and uh, hopefully you will too after this. So he he tells the story. You know, Joe is, uh, is Māori, Fijian, he basically had came to comedy, you know, in his, his early twenties from, you know, just an itch that he wanted to scratch. But once he got a shot, he just dug in and he ran like hell. He very much is a student of the whole of the business, just constantly learning, constantly networking. Uh, he is just one of the most impressive, engaging, uh, heady people I've ever had on the show. Uh, I think I think you'll like it. The Fold is brought to you by Vodafone, for which I'm very grateful to have conversations like this. It's an absolute privilege. Uh, Vodafone has world-class network technology. Get your business on it right now at vodafone.co.nz. This is Joe Damon on The Fold. Tanakwe, Joe. Welcome to The Fold. Damn, it's, uh, it's crazy being here, Dunk. I appreciate you having me. Uh, for anybody listening, basically how this came around is I just messaged Dunk on Twitter, which I've also never done. You really? won't know. I've never, ever done. I just messaged Dunk saying, big fan, brother. Love The Fold in particular. I've watched every episode. Favorite episode, probably Sinead Boucher. Oh, really? Yeah, probably my favorite one. <laughs> big fan of her. So um, no, it's a pleasure being here, brother. Oh, no. Thank, <laughs> thanks for coming <laughs> on board. I mean, you're obviously in the weeds. And I want to talk about the fact, because there's a lot, you're, you are, you know, you're a hot mic talent you know but you're also in the business and mostly your people are one or the other and I, I think that that's one of the things that makes you such an interesting uh presence in in you know in the various scenes in which you operate but what I wanted to do was um was start by you normally like I skip over people's backstory but I think yours is, is so interesting and and I think it really feels like it's an animating presence within your life now like you remember that Joe, when you are this one, and yeah. uh, so tell me about that that journey from like your your mate's couch or even your your car to where you are right now. Damn, it's um, yeah, I, I, it's something that it's still surreal to me and so crazy to me, which is why I reflect back on it quite often. Because yeah, exactly like you were saying, I still very clearly remember it, and so I think people get sick of it the amount of times I bring it up. But it's just it's genuinely so crazy for me to look back and see how far it's come. So it was. Um, I started comedy in 2017, so I was doing property development, which is, I don't know if you know many young brown dudes in property development, I don't know but they, so. they don't tend to strive in that place. Like, <laughs> it's not really built for us to succeed in. So I, I really, really struggled in it. Like I, um, you know, I'm just, I, I'm not, 
I'm not great in corporate environments, just my personality in general, let alone something like that that's quite like, you know, for a lot more like older, I guess, than well, all I can say was the people that strive in it and, and do well, so, so different to like the type of person I was. So I was sort of at a crossroads and basically I just decided to try out all these things I'd always wanted to try, stand up being one of them. I remember it was 2017, um, I was about 21 and I uh, went and tried it out, did this open mic and uh, literally bro from, I've never had anything just click for me just like that and I tried it and straight away I was like, okay, sweet, uh-huh. we're starting and it just started this absolute roller coaster of a journey and then um, <laughs> unlike most stand-up comedians when they start, from the moment I started I knew I was going to be able to build a career for myself out of it, whatever it looked like. And so I, um, I, I went and incorporated uh, my company with the company's office, um, West Park, had, like, we'd had absolutely no, like, anything in, in, you know, in development or anything, didn't know anything about the industry, but I just watched Kevin Hart and I saw that he had a production company. And so I was like, okay, if the good comedians have production companies, I should probably start one. So a month after starting stand up, I then registered my company and then was just like, okay, I'm a comedian with a production company. And I just kind of went from there. I mean, and I want to talk about West Park uh, at the back because I do think that's one of the signature differences. But, Mm. you know, like I've always been fascinated by people within particular sectors who who come at things differently. Like, you know, I don't. I'm not, I, I, I don't love 660's music, but I find 660, the way that they've approached it as a business from sure. the jump, so interesting. And it should be instructive for even for other artists who, who don't, don't, don't necessarily mm. like 660 either. So you must be able to learn from that. And yes. I feel like most comics, most people who, who come at comedy or music or whatever from an art side, they don't think about the business side and they often grow resentful of that yes. rather than viewing it as an opportunity to learn. Well, what is your, you know, do, do you feel like at home in comedy or do you feel like you're in your own Joe, Joe Damon lane in, in some respects? Yeah, that's an awesome question. But I think um, from day one, I never really felt like I, I had belonged. I think because from day one, I'd always had sort of a business minded approach to the entire industry and in the sense that there's a lot of sort of things that they say you have to sort of do on your way to developing as a comedian and for me it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to go through a lot of those rings and so I just started to develop kind of my own um, pathway and just in doing that it did kind of separate me um, from a lot of the people, um, and I'm not even meaning like I was like better than them. That's not the just case at different, all. Right? I was just different, yeah. yeah. Like 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 group group shows and improv and sure. you know, starting small and creeping your way up and getting your first hour. Yeah. I feel like because you came in sort of naturally through social media. Is that is that fair to say? Like, describe your relationship with social media and audience building that through there. Yeah. So when I first came in, the only comedian. I guess, local comedian that was very New Zealand-centric. So, I mean, somebody that wasn't like, you know, Rose or Flight of the Concords who were just this, like, out-of-the-world, international, like, level um, talent. The only one that I saw that was selling tickets at, like, a quantity that I really wanted to get to was Jimmy Jackson, which <laughs> you already know, Dunk. Like, <laughs> yeah. and, Jimmy, and Jimmy won't mind me saying so. He's not a stand-up comedian. You know, he's, he's, he did it all through social media. And so when I came in, I saw guys um, who were really successful in stand-up and, you know, they were doing well at the festivals and they were selling, you know, doing great Getting shows. award nominations, all award that nominations. whole thing, that whole culture. And Jimmy, just from social media, was beating all of them. And in the industry, there was a lot of resentment towards Jimmy because of what he was doing in that space. And so I saw what Jimmy was doing, and I saw that, okay, I love how he's built his own audience there, but then I also did really appreciate the art of stand-up and what was being done in the space. Like Nick Ratto, Pax Society, a lot of those guys I really looked up to when I first came in. And I, I wanted to be the quality that they were at, but also take advantage of, you know, what Jimmy was taking advantage of. Well, because, I mean, ultimately, like, you, you know, 
the biggest dream of all, the, the first step on in terms of anything is like make a living out of it, of you know, and and be able to do that on your own yeah. terms rather than hoping that you get a bank ad or something. Exactly. You know? exactly. And that, that got by you three months. You know, yes. maybe maybe if it goes real well. And I think that, that that's that's the thing again that, that sort of feels different. I mean you you mentioned uh, Kevin Hart before and that, that again feels like you know historically, you know, someone like Kevin Hart you, he would just be famous, and that's the yeah. main thing you'd know about him. He's yeah. famous. I'm a fan, but now you, there's this ability to kind of get into the weeds of the business behind them, to study them, their, their careers, what what made them. Uh, you know, how did you do that, and how how much was the sort of you know you're a student of the craft, but also a student of the the business side. It, it was, if I'm completely honest, it was always more attention to how do I make this like not only sustainable, but how do I make allow myself to prosper financially in something that I'm also really good at. Because I, I figured out young that, like, I think that's the key to life is, like, how do you be able to live off of something that you enjoy doing? And then I reckon even better, how do you make heaps of money from it? And so <laughs> once I found stand-up, bro, because I, I had figured out that the relationship between those two things, I was lucky to figure that out quite young that that's possible. And once I found out that stand-up could be the thing for me, I was like, okay, this is going to be it. So how do I build a business while still allowing myself to stay true to like my values and my sensibilities. And um, I pretty much spent about three years, like I uh, purposely didn't push the social media side of things because for me I knew once I do put my head into it, like I know it'll just go. I knew that from day one. And so my thing was how do I build this vision and develop all these things that I want to go and do so that by the time it does start to hit, I know exactly what I need to do at each stage. And so it's been a weird case of for three years, I was really struggling figuring it out, like putting the plan together. And then from the day, from what I say was my day one, from there, it's just always sort of clicked and just continued to develop. And yeah, it's it's been a weird thing. And it's so fascinating. So what, what, well, during those three years of kind of building out the, the vision for it, you know, how were you making a living then and... and and what was the plan, or, or to the extent that it's been revealed, or you can reveal it? Yeah, yeah. So through through there, I was um, I was labouring. So I would um, basically just like casual labour, but it was cool. But casual labouring was cool because you could work five hours a week, or you could work like sixty. Yeah. So I would. Um, I, I used to do a lot of work for these guys, um, Dark Horse. Oh, true. Yeah, you know the, 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 yeah, the, yeah, the events company. Yeah, the events company. I used to do a lot of labouring for them. Um, they wouldn't have any idea that I worked there because <laughs> <laughs> they paid in cash. But um, I was like, <laughs> nah, nah. nah, I definitely gave my ID number to someone. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, worked, I worked for those guys for a bit and just a lot of like different companies like that. Yeah. So it was really cool. Like I got to work at the ASB Tennis and heaps of these real like random events, homegrown. And so it was just kind of But you're also labouring. watching these various kind yes. of relationships industries operate up close. Absolutely. And so that was, for me, everywhere I tried to get experience, I was really intentional about trying to learn. And I was always like asking questions and um, really trying to, because like university, it I just wasn't the way for me. I, I really got behind like people that were doing a lot of things, not even necessarily in industries I was in, and just really learned like their journeys and what they were going through. And um so yeah, I just did a lot of labouring. Um, I cleaned caravans for yeah, for how long would that have been? Probably like almost a year. That that was cool. Um, just honestly, anything. I was taking any job to try and just keep it afloat, and then just keeping this sort of stand up dream going. Really. And so, so you you were gigging through that period. Yeah, yeah, actively, always actively gigging. Like through that period, I was probably gigging three, four times a week. Um, you know, any time up to like seven times a week trying to get on every day. I used to um, run this gig on, um, it started out as a music open mic. And because there weren't, wasn't enough stage time in Auckland for comedians, I would go rock up to music open mics <laughs> and just go do stand up at those. And bro, they were like, I would die every time because, you know, everybody's there to like hear someone play the ukulele and here's me like <laughs> trying to throw out some jokes. And so um, at Portland Public House just in Kingsland, I used to go. Uh, it's not the right. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up. It went well enough that uh, Emma, who used to run it, the open mic was just like, just run a comedy night here. And so that was the first time I ever run like my own comedy night. So yeah, it was just years of just really grinding and hustling and trying to put it all together, which is so, it's so crazy to look back at. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the, the whole time, I mean, when, when you're laboring, when you're, when you're 
doing your open mics, you're learning, right? You're um, and your mind's your own. You know, you'd be cleaning a caravan and and kind of ticking over, yeah. building out that that uh, that ultimate plan of yours. So, what do you consider that that day day one? You know, what was you know, how did, how did your life change at that point? Yeah. So, what I had always considered day one was going to be when I was able to make the crossover from stand up to um, television. So, for me, I always knew. Okay, so there's social media and you can use social media to take advantage of opportunities in stand-up, which I saw that Jimmy had done. But um, what I'd always also seen is that a lot of social media personalities found it really difficult, especially brown social media personalities, found it really difficult to cross over to that other end. And so I knew for me it wasn't going to be good enough that I just was big on social media or had done well. I knew that wasn't the case. So I had to go and make a statement that was understandable, the scale of it, in another world outside of social media. So for, for me, I knew I had to make a statement in stand-up. And so that's why I went and did the Sky City shows um, sort of middle of 2020. And I was not ready for those shows, but I knew that we could sell them out. And I knew that if we do sell them out or when we do, that that'll be a big enough statement that, okay, this guy crosses over into more than just social media. And so there's actually more to this than just the numbers we see on screen, people were actually showing up. But how did... I mean, I, I'm just trying to put this together. <laughs> oh, that's right? so random. No, because playing Sky City Theatre, like that's, that's, that's like 660 when they booked the, the town hall for yeah. their first shows in Auckland. Sorry to keep harping on no, that. I'm, lo- I'm loving it, though. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It's like there's an audacity to it. Yeah. And, that, that, and, a, and a sense that, you know, you can imagine all of the, um, the, the comics who've been playing, the, the basement and building audience by that traditional way of being going... Like, you, the fuck you doing? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. How, so how did you, and you didn't do it once, you did it twice. Did like, it twice, yeah. What, what uh, you know, how did you get that confidence and, and how did you sort of create enough of a sense of moment that, that you could actualize this audience into, into that one place to, to fill those big, big rooms? It, it, it was funny because I guess for me, like I just, I always took the numbers like seriously, and I don't mean that in the sense that I was obsessed with them. One thing that I've found is a struggle with um, with business and with like just using social media in general is a lot of like companies in particular, they don't actually take the numbers seriously. So they'll see the numbers and be like, oh, that's not good enough. But that's purely based on like something completely unrelated to what they're doing. For me, like I saw the numbers coming through and I engaged with the people like in real time and like I was I would talk to these people um, people would pull me up on the street like I would you know I would you physically see like a heat index exactly of, like of, I, would, I would see it and bro like I've never been famous in my life and I'm like rocking down um, we, we were doing like gigs in random places like Christchurch like selling selling it out in you know minutes and I'm walking along like the Avon River and random people like coming up to me and so it was it was being able to see it like firsthand that was when I knew and and that was based on your social media activity at that point you you'd figured out a way to kind of game the not game the thing but yeah. but you knew how to operate in that area in the way that generated a fandom that then wanted to um, engage with you that were willing to pay money to be in the same room as you and watch you do your thing yeah hundred percent and and you know i'm I'm not um ashamed in saying like it it was gamed in a sense because like I knew for me that moment of being able to sell it out in the way that I did I knew like I was honest with everyone I was like I probably wouldn't be able to do this again in any other moment even if I was to wait another week or two or a month like I know how fickle social media is and this could be this opportunity could be gone in even a month's time so I was like whilst I'm not ready as a stand-up comedian I'm ready to take the bigger picture next step and so these shows probably aren't going to be great but for what it could lead on to, I've been ready for that for years. So I'll do this now. And, you know, the rest of that, we'll just figure it out as we go. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Well, we're going to come back. I want to talk about Celebrity Treasure Island briefly because <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge fan. And then I want to talk about West Park and the, the next stage because it's one thing to excel in that, uh, you know, in, in that live arena and to, to have those big milestones or this is a whole other thing entirely so we'll, we'll be back with more from Joe Damon shortly The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out of home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis 
Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. We're back with uh, Joe Damon, and, and just before we get into the, to talking about Westpark and this this big, uh, it's kind of an amazing story, um, I want to talk about something which, in some ways, like it's like a it could be seen as a as a deviation. It, it, I'm I'm just guessing that it doesn't. It's not a particularly lucrative thing, but it was a. It was a, a show that I loved. I, I recapped it um, on, on another <laughs> podcast. But, like, talk to me about Celebrity Treasure Island because I think for a lot of people outside of your Quantico audience, that was your sort of a, a, a different kind of, of a breakout. What was what was it like doing and what was the function of it to the sort of, you know, that, that big, long, multi-stage dream of yours? Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was really crazy because for me it was a, the main – the main key to um, to doing it was that very much securing that crossover effect for you know for a lot of people, um, and I think it's kind of always been like this. If you sort of stay in one place, they'll keep you in one place, and it's even more so. If, even if you try and cross over, they're very much like, "Nah, stay right there." I I love LeBron James, and anytime he cro- you know he talks about moving into business or you know any of his business exploits or anything outside of basketball. People hate it, and so for me, um, I never wanted to be known just as, as a stand-up comedian. And so I knew if the opportunities came to start to achieve things in other areas, I really had to be active in taking those. And even if it wasn't necessarily anything I'd planned, which you know, doing reality TV, I never, never ever thought I would. Um, it's I, I, th- I thought it'd be really important to to say yes to those kind of things and. Yeah, it was it was a huge opportunity. It was mean. I watched a shitload of reality TV, <laughs> and that cast felt different. Like the the way that they got on, the the, the t- timing of when it aired, the fact that it was here and not on. So on. there was just there was just something about it, and the relationship that you had with the likes of uh, Chris and Lance and so on. Obviously, there was the the game within the game, <laughs> yeah. but also they felt like there was something more there. Like was is that is that fair? Yeah, it's probably funny for other people to hear this, but. Um, the whole time, Chris, Lance, myself, um, T- Tegan as well, Johnny, two of us are shit. Mm. You know, mm. we're, that's that's five people who, whilst it probably seems like uh, in position, you know, it probably seems to people that we're people that have been, you know, just cruising through and gotten things just like that. But all five of us, you know, we've really been on the path that we're on for years, and it's been years of grinding and trying to get it together. And um, and then we all sort of, in a very very full circle way get to come together in this joint moment of like, wow, we're like being, you know, seen. <laughs> it's us now. That's yeah. Cra- yeah, it was crazy, bro. And so, you, you know, even to the point like m- me and Chris used to, because um, I, I used to do the the odd show with Snort, um, the improv group that Chris and Brindley are part of. Yeah. And Brindley are very much included in all of us as well. Sorry, Bryn. Um We used to go do like, uh, you know, improv workshops at Tapac together. And no one knew who any of us were back then, you know, like three, four years ago. And so, you know, here's me, Chris and Bryn, who used to do those workshops. We're sitting on this mainstream TV show together, just cracking up, like, what are we doing here? And, and um, it's still surreal to me that it was, I was even um, a part of it. And um, But I think the biggest thing for me was, like, there was a real intention around, like, doing the show. So when I was about 20, I think I was about 22, West Park, I'd had it for about six months and um, still had done nothing with it. I went and um, watched this talk that Julie Christie did. True. Yes, yeah, so I went and watched um, – and because I was always really fascinated with the idea of producing reality TV. 
And so I went and um, listened to her talk about like how she started. I was going to say iWorks, but she sold it. Did she sell it to iWorks? No, no, no she, she found that iWorks. She sold it to Warner Brothers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Got you. So, yeah, so it's how she started. Um, it was called, maybe it was called Touchdown. Touchdown, that's, that's what right. it was. Yeah, yes. sold to sold iWorks. To iWorks. And iWorks. So these things always get just endlessly rolled up yeah. until one thing owns it. Anyway, Jules is rich as hell. So I was like, okay. I'm going to go learn and, and hear this talk. But she talked about, um, you know, selling the, the format and she talked about selling formats. And that was the first time I've actually learned about the idea of selling formats. And I really got fix, uh, like fixated on building a business around that. And I've always really followed like what Julie had done, researched a lot about her like, over all the years. And so when the, um, when the offer came through to be a part of the show. Work on one of her, her format. Ex- yeah. She was, so Treasure Island was her. Exactly, bro. And so my thing was like, oh, wow, this is not only full circle for me in the way that this is a show that I very much learnt the history about because I'm so interested in this part of the business. Um, but secondly, it's like an opportunity for me to actively go and see how these kinds of productions like work. And so, uh, yeah, anybody that worked on the production, like they would get annoyed at me because we're not supposed <laughs> to talk to the crew. And I'm like talking to the crew and like asking Tim, the producer, questions and stuff. He's like, mate, can you worry about like the challenge? I'm like, bro, I don't care about the challenge. I don't give a shit about being here. I want to know what you do. I'm like, a uni right yeah, now. Yeah, straight up, bro. And so they were... Um, they were very much getting annoyed by like me just like watching everything and and not being like too fussed about the challenges and that. But it was um that was a super full circle moment for me. Um, just really getting behind the scenes and and learning about how those run and yeah, it was so it was so cool, man. Like, it was such a blessing to be a part of. So so tell me about Westpac. You, you started on on a on a whim, kind of, you know, just because you know it feels no, like the thing to do, and yeah. now you breathe life life into it. So it's actually. Yeah, you know, it's become a business. You got you got an office downtown. In fact, just near where the spinoff was uh, was founded too. So, t- tell me about how that went from almost like a you know a little affirmation towards your future to to something concrete. Yeah, it was. It's, it's been crazy. So, like our first, I guess our first like proper production was. Um, I did this web series called uh, This Is Auckland in 2018, and I had just finished um, writing for John O and Ben, working after working under Cam and Bronwyn Becker, who you know everyone knows them. They're the superstars, yeah, 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 the superstars in TV here. So I learned so much from Cam and uh, Cam and Bron, and like they were awesome for me. Like I was, you know, 22 at the time, and only been in stand up for like barely a year and they gave me my first chance in, in TV and I, I loved the experience at John O and Ben. Don't really know if there was much to do with me but it got cancelled the year I started so <laughs> um, I didn't have a job for long but um, but I came off of that super inspired and so I started writing um, I guess like my own TV show which was the show called This Is Auckland and um, one of the and it was basically the show where I play th- all three characters and all three characters are just these three dudes trying to figure out their place in, in Auckland <laughs> And, uh, yeah, yeah, which is still me right now. So, <laughs> um, and one of the guys, uh, so that was our very first production, just this little web series that I self produced. One of my mates, um, directed, so throw together, pulled it off in like three days, absolutely no planning, just did it. And, um, so w- where I'm going with this is in 20, end of 2020, I had just finished writing for, writing on SIS. Which is a show coming out on Comedy Central. Um, incredible show. Yeah, created by Hanel Harris, the uh, the amazing Hanel Harris, and um, so finished writing on there. And Hanel said to me, she was like, uh, and and all, all the writers, she was like, hey, you, if you guys are, are keen to um, do your own show, like pitch it to us and we'll do it with you. And um, everybody knows of me. You can't say stuff like that to me and not expect the email the next day. (laughs) (laughs) So me, I heard that. I was like, yep, sweet. And so uh, this is Auckland, which we did back in 2018. I flicked it through to Hanau um, probably end of 2020, start of 2021. And um, she basically just gave it the the yes. And and one massive thing that she granted was she was like, yes, we'll support you in producing the show. But one thing that I asked it was like, can West Park co-produce? Because at this point, we don't, we still haven't had a production. Well, you know, four years later, we still had nothing. And, um, but she said yes, bro, like literally off of, off of nothing and really like backed my vision. She knew my vision for West Park and what I wanted to do. But, um, but she was the person that really kicked off sort of anything by allowing us to co-produce with her company, Culture Factory. And then, um, 
oh, this is going to go to some crack up places, this story. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's go. But then what happened was, um, so we start developing it, and um, she asked me, she was like, so who's the platforms you want to talk to? And I straight away I was like, Comedy Central. I was just, <laughs> my mum always taught me just ask, and you know, you won't ask if you, you won't get if you don't ask. And, and, Sis was already Sis. on Com- Comedy Central, so th- so that was not a, just a name plucked out. Exactly, of the, yeah. yeah, exactly. So Sis was already there, and so I, I asked her if, yeah, if if it was if it would be possible if we could go for that, and um, but she said yes straight away. And like Hanel's biggest thing is she just wants to create capacity for young brown people, and she knows that um, a lot of them, with despite the talent, won't get those opportunities, and so when they come. She wants to be the one to just Sit yeah. If she's in a yeah position to say yes. She wants. She she always will. And bro, she said yes the whole way through, and I can't thank her enough for it. And so the Comedy Central stuff. Basically, she has an amazing relationship with Sky, who are basically responsible for making all that happen. And yeah, we we Comedy Central agreed to platform the show off of sort of the developed ideas we put together. And we were so lucky that we had those clips from This Is Auckland of the bouncer character from there. To send through to them, and they loved it, and just got it straight away. So, yeah, man, it was it was the craziest thing. And then um, <laughs> where CTI comes into the mix, I, I, I don't know. I might get in trouble for this, but who knows? <laughs> we'll just see. So where CTI comes into the mix is, so we start doing promo and stuff for CTI, but the because um, how for anybody listening, how television in New Zealand works is you you get a platform partner basically who says they'll platform you, but then you still have to go to New Zealand on air to get the funding. And so we got the yes from Comedy Central, but then we still, obviously, you still have to wait for NZ on air to give you any money. So um, we're putting together the proposal as I'm going to Celebrity Treasure Island. And so <laughs> there was this part where we have, we're supposed to have given our phones in, but they still needed to have meetings and stuff with me to, <laughs> to put together the proposal. And I'm like on the island and like island clothes and stuff with this like hidden phone like on the, on the phone up there. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing meetings and stuff. And I'm like checking over my shoulder <laughs> in case uh, anyone sees me with my phone. And so, yeah, bro. And then I came off the island and it was about three, four weeks later that the funding w- was announced and, yeah, we got it. So this is for bouncers. This is for bouncers. And then that was kind of when we could announce that, yeah, we have a show coming out with Comedy Central, co-produced with Culture Factory um, and Sky New Zealand. Sky TV made it all possible. Um and what's so, the yeah. what's the current status of it? And when's it when's it coming out? And so it's still still in development. Like yep. I guess that's the the one thing that's tough about scripted uh, television is that it's a long development period. But um, but, but that's yeah, also probably good, right? Yeah. Like I feel like a lot of stuff in New Zealand doesn't get developed long yes. enough. They're just trying to smash it out to keep the pipe full. You yes, know? and and Thomas. Um, so sorry, Tom. I usually just call him Tommy, so I can't remember his last name. But he's the commissioner um, in charge of this guy. He's been so awesome with really allowing us to incubate the idea and, and push the development process. Because one of the things he said early was development, they don't really take it as seriously here as other places. Mm. And that, yeah, exactly as you said, like it does tend to get rushed out and that he doesn't want to put that pressure when it comes to, you know, re- really trying to like rush something out and... Um, so Sky, Sky have been awesome in, in really allowing us to try and build something that we can be proud of. And um, So I can't thank all the commissioners. Annie and Dan are there as well. Like, they've all been awesome. Earlier on you talked about you know when you were your um, ill-fated uh, turn in property development and feeling that <laughs> there wasn't really a space for this young Māori Fijian uh, boy, boy in there. Uh, you know, and, and then you also mentioned that you know, Hanel wanting to give young brown creators a shot especially if they've got sort of business aspirations do you you know how has has your sort of your background your makeup impacted you as you've come into this industry which you're you know you're you're now crushing <laughs> really <laughs> honestly <laughs> no, i appreciate it bro, honestly no um i think yeah it, it has and it's funny what i think i thought may have been like a hindrance and I don't mean a hindrance like anything related to you know what I look like or my age I think just more a hindrance than what you had what I would have had access to I think as I've gotten older I've realized like the biggest thing that separates like people like myself young brown people from people that seem to be really succeeding in a lot of these areas it's just the access access to information access to you know a, a 
like opportunities. That's the biggest thing that I saw was the big separation. And so like I really learned in my relationship with Hanel that that's really all she was opening up. Like, you know, she, she, she doesn't have the time to like be teaching me and, you know, like getting me a whiteboard and, you know, running through everything, but she has the time to like provide opportunity where she can. And so for me, I've, whilst West Park had always had that vision of doing the same, I realized how we very much want to continue that same idea onwards as well. And so I think really taking business things seriously, like business mentors and like networking and stuff like that, that I hadn't really taken seriously, I saw how much of a difference it made in a lot of these spaces. And so once I started actively doing it, I really started to help what we're doing. And I just started to enjoy the process a lot more. And so those little things like really, really helped and have allowed it to grow and continue growing in what it's doing at the moment. Yeah. So, so what, what, else, what is next for? I mean, obviously, your, your eventually development ends with Bounces. Yeah. Eventually, eventually, your shoot it will come out. What are you doing in parallel with that? And, and where, what is the sort of big dreams? Just don't hold back. Yeah, <laughs> What's yeah. the so, vision there? So, we have probably about six, we'll say five different shows in development at the moment. Who, who with, is we right now? So, there's seven of us at the, at the company. Yeah, so it's it's going well, and um, so we've got yeah we've got about five different projects in development, and we're in the middle. We've we've just started an awesome content partnership with Maori TV, and because um, one of the things that and and it wasn't even anything they were actively looking for, like we just started having conversations about like what they were, what they were needing, and then I was talking to them about what West Park sort of has, and one thing that they were really struggling with, which I think is a TV struggle across the board is um, they were struggling to create content that connected to Rangatahi, to young people, and then content that can that really um, did well online. This is the whole industry. The to, whole to industry. To be honest, like it's them and everyone. The entire industry. And so once, like, because I, I always knew that was a problem, but I had never heard people in the industry actually acknowledge it as the problem. And so... Normally the policy is pretend it's not happening exactly. and just say you actually are connecting Ex- with them. Exactly. And um, I've got to give all the credit to Marumena Roderick, who's the head of content at Māori TV. She was super, super transparent in saying, like, this is a problem that we're facing and it's um, really killing us. Like, we're looking for solutions. And so I brought them, like, well, we're all a bunch of young people. We know how to create content for digital we know how to connect to audiences, but we don't have the resources. You guys don't know how to connect to audiences, but have the resources. If we come together, let's kiss and hug, call it a date. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, bro, we started this partnership with them, which has been awesome. They commissioned this show, Rags of Riches, which we've just finished. It's about to release on the 28th of Feb um, on Māori TV. And, uh, bro, it was an entirely, uh, a crew entirely in their 20s. And um, I'm, not even, I'm not even shitting you. Nobody had ever done television. And the show looks unreal. This is amazing. Yeah. And it was one of the things that I really like pushed on them. And I, I will give them credit. Like, bro, they were way more open to it than I thought. But I said, it's like, it's an intentional thing. Like, we need to use people that have never done television before because you need to see the type of talent and the product. Talent that's been fostered on social media can create. Because what a lot of people do is they see the talent on social media and then they think, no, nah, that can't cross over. But in the same way that I was able to do it, I'm like, there's this whole industry of young kids that can do it. And if we're the only place that can bridge those two, like we absolutely will be there. And so Rags of Riches is this first one and we're going to do a bunch of production under this content partnership with Māori TV. And then we have a bunch of other relationships where we're trying to build similar things, but and with sort of different um, intentions. But Māori TV are very much that one that they're empowering, you know, the next generation to come to the industry and they don't have to, do it in the way that the industry says they have to. They've done it in their own way. So I think that's been pretty cool. Eh? Yeah, that's amazing. That's exactly what they, you know, that, that that's what they're there for. Yeah. So uh, is it is it in scripted? Is it comedy? What's the, and what's, is there a kind of a defined scope for, for where West Park's going to play? Yeah, so with a lot of these productions, what we want to do is we want to build up a lot of capacity. And so through a lot of my experience, I've learned that the quickest productions are unscripted. And not only are they the quickest turnaround, they're the cheapest. So And the, the audience is enormous. And the, la- yeah. the an, o- audiences love them. And so for us, where we're sort of focusing is in that unscripted, um, sort of looser format type show. 
and uh, and then the bigger scale ones will kind of move towards scripted for bigger scale sort of shows because the struggle that I've sort of seen is a lot of these like really awesome concepts that are by young people they usually just get thrown into you know some small like and and I yeah I, I don't mean to sound ungrateful but relatively small um, rounds specifically for like an online platform. And they just really struggle to be incubated and be given the chance to actually succeed. And then those examples are usually used as a reason for why they don't continue to give those opportunities. Totally. And, and so for us, we're just like, okay, if we're the one place that can be the thing that everyone else points to, like it worked there for other people to go get an opportunity that are young and really trying to figure out a way, like we so want to be there. And so that's why we even like, we're, going to build an entire brand around like everything we're doing. It's all going to go on social media, like all the behind the scenes and everything. Yeah, because that's really the other gonna... piece is like, what, is television the right place for this anymore? Exactly. How, how do you go and re- find it? It's what, you know, you can get the creators, you can get all the things you want to set up to succeed, but how do you go and find that audience? Because that audience isn't where they were. Yeah, so the, the biggest thing that we're going to do is in the same way that I built my personal brand, we're going to build the company's brand and build an audience around the company so that... Oh, so you almost go kind of vertical in that respect. Yeah, exactly. And so that per production, we can come to each um, property, each thing that each piece of content we've developed with a pre-built audience that are already just following us and what we're doing anyways. And then that's not even to say the audience that comes from, you know, whatever happens with the production afterwards, which is also beneficial because we know how to push the content further after it comes out as well. Yeah, because it's it's then you've got manufacture and promotion and distribution. Yeah. All bottled in one, and if you're the, you know, if you're the platform, exactly, that's a very compelling proposition. Exactly, and and I think one thing that I've really learned a lot from you guys, and I think you've done it really well in the podcasting space, is marrying the idea of content creation with the commercial side of things. Like I think you've done that really beautifully, and that's one thing that I was really paid attention to because I think the television industry and the content, the visual content industry in general, like film as well in New Zealand can really benefit from taking on a lot of those um, sort of concepts and ideas because, you know, like public funding can only do so much. And like I know a lot of like the people at the different public funders and they're awesome, but, you know, that's a lot of responsibility for such a small group of people. And um, you, you're never going to get all the best stuff if it's just in one place. And so... For us, we've also started to build up commercial partnerships and we've just landed like a, a massive one even just yesterday, which has been awesome. And because what we're trying to do is marry the commercial side of content and all these brands that want content with all these awesome ideas that are really connecting online that need the resources, bringing them together and really commercializing like the content as a, as a whole and just sort of bringing together these two things that need each other that haven't really had the opportunity to do so. Yeah, and it just, you don't have to sort of ask the same kind of permission. Yeah, and yeah. It's uh, there's there's a there's a greater kind of playfulness when you don't have to go through that that process faster. Exactly, exactly. And, and yeah, I don't I don't fault the public funders for for um, getting it wrong at times because you know anybody would in that job. Like I would. I would fund the weirdest shit if I was, <laughs> if I was NZ on there. Like, I'm funding shit no one's watching, so I don't, <laughs> I don't blame them. But, but yeah, I, I think it's more so um, just finding other alternatives, and I think that just makes the industry stronger as a whole. And so that's one thing that we're really doing intentionally. And, um, and yeah, bro, like, uh, I think we would have built out a pretty good model of it. I, I give us about 18 months. I give us 18 months, and... We would have done it in a way that everybody will understand. Yeah, it's so exciting, so ambitious. Um, it's been so mean having you on the podcast, Appreciate it, bro. Man. Like, um, I'm in awe of what you're doing. So excited to watch it. No, nah, it means a lot, Doug. Thanks, bro. Cool. Thank you, Joe. That was Joe Damon on the fold. Such a fun conversation. I want to thank uh, Tahir Butler for recording it. I want to thank Jane Yee for running the the Spinner Podcast Network. I want to thank Vodafone for making it happen. The Spinner members for making everything we do here happen my god do we need you and you for listening please maybe write uh like subscribe do do all that especially on spotify they've just introduced that um i would appreciate the the boost uh yeah thanks for listening
That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.